Hey Refuge Church, I'm so excited. We're charging through the September holidays or the high holidays as they're known. I'm going to pray and we're going to jump into the holiday of Sukkot. Thank you God for another opportunity to look at your calendar and um, the biblical holidays. I pray that the themes and messages that you have pre-planned for your people to revisit year after year um, would be impactful to us, would speak to us wherever we are, that we might walk away from this space, not just uh, with a bevy of cool facts, um, but change, looking more like you, um, is stronger, more joyful, more comforted. Everything that we need is in you. And so I ask that you would minister to us today as we listen and as I speak. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so yes, tomorrow, Monday evening is the start of the festival of Sukkot. What is Sukkot all about? Well, toward the end of Exodus, the first thing that it's about, it's mentioned um, in conjunction with the agricultural year, right? Um, God's people until very recently have always been really in touch with the land and with creation. And so as we're wrapping up, um, the agricultural season, you would build a booth to live in during harvest, thus the festival of booths. But it has so much more than that, and the text tells us that there's so much more than that. So with little further ado, uh, let's look at what Leviticus says about this. Um, so on the 15th day, this is Leviticus 23 verses 39 through 43. On the 15th day of the seventh month, for seven days, when you gather in the produce of the land. So we talked last time about how this is always in the seventh month, right? All these holidays are all grouped together because just like the seventh day is the day of rest, the seventh month in the year is the month of rest. And we have all these holidays, boom, 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 in a row for a reason because we are supposed to really um, be spending most of the month off. All right, so gather in the produce of the land. There's the agricultural part we were talking about and celebrate the festival of Yahweh. Completely rest on the first and eighth day. Um, you can also translate rest cease. So stop it. Stop whatever you're doing, right? That encompasses both regular patterns that don't count as work. <coughs> excuse me, and also um, our recreational activities, which might not be fulfilling, but that we tend to do on the side. The cease or desist encompasses all of that. Stop, we're doing something else, right? The first and eighth day. Take to yourself on the first day the fruit of a beautiful majestic tree, okay? Palm fronds, boughs of leafy trees, and of the trees of the brook and rejoice in the presence of Yahweh your God for seven days. So we've had this lead up, right? We had these two days separately um, and now we have a full seven days and a bunch of weird instructions, right? To us, weird instructions around plants that we're going to get back to. Celebrate the festival to God every year. The word celebrate there um, is Chag, right? We talked about Chag means um, holiday, but it also means celebrate, celebrate, celebration, right? And celebration is the picture of a circle. So celebrate doesn't just mean, oh yeah, happy Valentine's Day, oh yeah, haha, -ha. post something on Facebook about it. No, it's coming together as a community, dancing in a circle perhaps, or marking the circle of the year. We talked about this, you know it. Okay, celebrate the festival to God every year. This is an engraved commandment for eternity in every era. We talked about that last week, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, celebrate it in the seventh month. Dwell in booths. Suk means booth. Um, so Sukkot just means booths. Dwell in booths for seven days. All those born in Israel must live in booths so that all might experientially know and all your eras that the children of Israel dwelt in booths when I brought them from the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. 
Okay, so we've got two weird things here, right? We have this booth stuff and we have this plant stuff, but um, handily, this is the only one that tells us right there, this is what it's about. Um, we're supposed to do that so that we might experientially know um, that the people dwelt in booths. So that's a little bit uh, random, right? Um, why is it that it's so important to God's people to remember that they were in booths? Um, uh, that is important, <laughs> weirdly, or else God wouldn't have put it there. But we tend to say, oh yeah, we just need to memorize our doctrine or these ideas and retell the story every year. It is important to retell stories every year. Stories that we retell make up who we are and our identity as a people, right? Whenever we talk about Christmas and God with us and Easter and the resurrection, that's important. Those are important things to remember. But it doesn't just say to know that. It says uh, the word yada, experientially know that God is with us. So what does that look like in Yisrael now? If you've ever had the pleasure of being in Yisrael during the festival of Sukkot, you can immediately tell as you can with all the uh, all of the holidays, the Chagim in Israel, because um, every home and every restaurant and every business uh, has to comply with this holiday. And so they put, they build these booths out of like canvas and pipe, but also palm fronds on top. And there are so many in the like alleyways that you have to like squeeze by and it's hard to navigate because everyone has their booths out there and uh, they sleep out there and they eat out there. It's a commandment to eat in one during, um, during Sukkot. And so it's a very fun time of year. The palm trees in Jerusalem all get shaved <laughs> and their palm fronds are all put on the ground by the city so that you can come and grab some for your roof if you need for the roof of your booth. Um, so that's what it looks like. Um, but what's the deeper um, purpose of what's going on there? So in the Exodus story, they come out of Mitzvahim. That's what we celebrate at the holiday of Passover, of Pesach, right? The experience of rescue by God, deliverance by God. We all have had some kind of amazing experience of deliverance, even if it's as small as getting a, a passing grade on a test that we're praying about um, or making it through a crazy almost accident in our car. Um, we know that the whoa, um, deliverance feeling that you get from that. But God says that his story doesn't end there. Things aren't over at Pesach. The year begins at Pesach, right? It starts in the spring, according to the Bible, not tradition. Um, and so... The story continues from there and he sees the people in Exodus, it says, as they come out, it says that they dwelt in Sukkot once they left Egypt. And so in the wilderness, in these spaces that we find ourselves, God is still with us. God is still providing for us when we are continuing to stay um, out of the tight, confining place that was so bad for us. The recovery community would tell us that this is so important, right? Um, sometimes you have your intervention and your rehab experience and you come out all fresh and new and that is just the beginning of your pathway in recovery as you try to refine your steps and it's so important to know that it's not just, hey, Jesus saves that one time. Um, I raised my hand at the concert or the service, but Jesus saves over and over and over and God is for us over and over and over. He's our daily bread. Um, he's our shelter also in the desert while we're trying to find our way home, right? So that's the central idea of Sukkot. But what's up with these branches? How do they possibly um, tie together with that theme, with that idea? Um, so the Ashkenazi community and the Sephardi community, so two big groups of um, Jewish people and tradition believe that it is, we're told to celebrate with these branches. And so they encircle an area with uh, these things, these elements being held together, which is a lovely ceremony. Um, but 
um, the Kara'im, a different Jewish community, believes that you're supposed to build your booth with those things, which to me makes a little bit more sense. Um, I am very happy to have conversations with people who think otherwise. Um, I'm totally open to that, but it seems to me that if it's on the first day, you're supposed to take all those things and then it says later dwell in booths, perhaps you're supposed to build your booth from those, uh, from those elements, right? Just a possibility. So why those four things? Very specific, I'll read them again. The fruit of the beautiful majestic tree, um, palm fronds, boughs of leafy trees, and the trees of a brook. So um, one of the things that doesn't stand out to you, even if you've been in Yisrael during Sukkot, is that they did not have Amazon or cars at that time, right? So you couldn't just go down to the market and somebody who's brought them all up in a truck, you can't just snag some, um, you can't order them, you have to go get them, right? Um, and what stands out from that interesting list, a fruit tree, uh, palm fronds, a leafy tree, and a tree that grows by a brook, is those are all in radically different places around the land of Yisrael, or the land. Um, palm fronds, of course, are in the desert or by the coast. Um, trees that are, it says like a thick, thick um, bough is this the idea behind the, the Hebrew there. That's going to be up north once everything is much greener. Probably the similar for the fruit um, trees. And then that's all of them, right? So you have, oh, and the fruit tree, excuse me, is going to be in the Shvela, which is the area where all the farming um, happens. So you have dotted from all around the land these trees. Um, and so there's an interesting parallel there that um, maybe your family dwelling in booths as having to camp together going and finding each of these trees. It's a little sacred treasure hunt, um, scavenger hunt rather. But, and that does teach you that your family um, ancestors used to have to wander and wherever they wandered, that God was still with them and for them. But that's still a very individualistic perspective, right? We bring all this baggage that we don't even think of when we come to the text, like, oh, what would my family do? Rather than a larger people group do as a whole together. It's not just you on your own having your private spiritual experience, which a lot of us are much more comfortable with. Um, maybe posting it on Instagram is, uh, or whatever app is as public as we like to get with our spiritual experiences. But for them, they probably, I would say, nearly definitely did not have time to take off before the other holidays start, right? To go and wander the land and leave their jobs and their land and their animals behind to go and find all of these trees. And so what did you need? You need community. Ah, we need community when we're celebrating. You can have a circle dance by yourself. It's true. Um, you can meditate um, on the different themes of these holidays on your own. That is true. But these uh, practices are meant to be done as a community together. Again, in discussion, I would love to come up as a community non appropriative non exoticizing ways for us to participate non legalistically in these holidays. It's a lot of nons, but they're important nons. Um, perhaps it's the time of year that uh, there is a family camp and we all go dwell in tents for a while. Word is different from tents and booths, but who knows? Maybe you want to go whole hog and build a build a booth out of tree branches. I will not tell you not to um, probably. Okay, so um, the point is, it's supposed to be done in community and how much different of an experience is that um, when you are able to come together because suddenly you need to know someone from Galil, from the Galilee, you need to know someone from the desert, you need to know someone from the coast, and you need to know someone from the Shvela.
Um, and you have to come together despite all your differences and despite the way that your lifestyles might be different, your ideas might be different, your theology might be very different depending on what area. Um, the North had a totally different dialect than the South. Um, another wild thing that we don't ever think about uh, when we're reading the text, but they had to come together in order to celebrate this holiday. So it's about Yes, God is for you, that is true. God is providing for you, that is true. But if we take some of our individualism off, it's also God is providing for us as a diverse community, celebrating all of our different traditions and different takes on things and different ways that we look and come together to do this holiday. And together, God is for us, right? Different than might come easily to white Christianity. There's more pictures of this idea, especially in the book of Ezekiel, Chazakiel, the scroll of Chazakiel. Um, beautiful, the number four, right? Those are four different plant elements or the four species as they're known in Judaism um, are echoed or uh, foreshadowed in uh, the book of Chazakiel in which there's these four beasts that face these four different ways standing for the four directions, or the four winds, or the four corners of the earth. And God is king in all of those, so he is here with you, and he's providing for his people wherever they might go. But at, in the middle and at the end of uh, the book of Chazakiel, there is a picture that also has these correlations with Sukkot, um, a continual picture that keeps coming up of a tree, ding, 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 tree, uh, and the tree describes the kingdom of God uh, or the place that is created when the people of God are doing the right thing. Oh, similar ideas there. Talk about the theology of kingdom later. But anyway, there's this tree and the kingdom is described as a beautiful tree in which all of these birds, it says every kind of wing, every species of bird can come and find a home in this tree. Hopefully, Refuge Church is a space kind of like that for you, where wherever you're coming from, whatever questions you're wrestling with, you can still find a home with us, regardless if you're a wonderful nightingale or a, a kind of odd toucan from Aladdin, maybe. <laughs> Spontaneous. Um, you can find a home with us and you can find a home with God in his kingdom, right? And so these people coming together with their branches are kind of making a weird looking tree, right? A diverse tree, but a tree that we all get to dwell in. They're living out that easy, that picture from Ezekiel, right? They're building this space, kind of like the Garden of Eden too, right? Trees, a paradise in which there's room for the people from at least all four, four corners of the land that they were dwelling in. Beautiful, right? But there is another layer. Do, 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 do. Rabbinic interpretation says that there's almost always another layer, right? Um, so I mentioned that there's a difference between booths and tents, right? Um, at least in name. Tents are cloth. Booths, I guess, don't necessarily have to be. It doesn't say exactly how to construct a booth, so I'm not sure that that's the point. So using our, uh, our ancient uh, Near Eastern mindset, our hermeneutic, our way of coming at the Bible, we might not ask those questions, which are so concrete um, and worried about logistics. And instead, what should we think? Oh yeah, what we talked about last week, the law of first mention, right? Where do booths, Sukkot, come up previously in the text? And why might be this festival um, named that in Leviticus? Um, it has a different name in Exodus, which is interesting. Well, super handy for us until uh, the Exodus story. There is only one mentioned previously, and our first mention comes from, that's weird, Genesis 33, Bereshit 33, almost as if it's all one story and God knew what he was doing when he lined up these uh, holidays, because the last one was in Genesis 33 as well. It's the same story. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Uh, so Genesis 33, we talked about Yaakov and Asav, 
um, last week, Jacob and Esau, um, Yaakov is very gratefully concerned to see his brother again. The last time he saw his brother, he was trying to kill him because Yaakov had severely wronged Esau and their whole family, honestly. And so uh, he comes to meet him and Esav surprises him by saying, oh, please know about the gifts. And he embraces him and kisses him and says, oh, it's so good to see you. Um, this comes right immediately after that. So uh, Esav has said, oh no, I don't need all these gifts. Please don't, I have enough. Um, he says, what's yours is yours, literally in the Hebrew. And Yaakov says, no, please take them. Um, still very concerned. I think there's another picture there about the way that God works with us, right? Of <laughs> okay, if you really want to do that sacrifice, um, not my preference, as he says in later books, but that's a theological bunny trail. So forgive me. Uh, that brings us to verse 12. Then he, Esau, said, let us journey and go on and I will go across from you. Your translation, if you're reading long, might say before you. There's a word for before, it's not that one. It's across, it's against. It's the same word um, that talks about in marriage. You're next to each other across, not one in front of the other. But he said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail. This is Yaakov talking and also rude. <laughs> oh, why is he saying all of his kids are frail? seems unnecessary. And the flocks and the cattle which are nursing are a concern to me. Now if they drove them hard for a day, all the flocks would die. That also seems very extra. Um, one day of them walking at a good pace and everyone's dead, apparently in Yaakov's world. So he says, let my Lord pass on before his servant and I will move along slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of my children until I come to my Lord in Sa'ir. Uh, there's a joke there. Sa'ir means um, hairy. And if you know the story from earlier, Esav is uh, two things, red and hairy. And Sa'ir means hairy and it's in a land, Edom, which means red. So jokes, Bible's got jokes. Verse 15, Esav said, let me leave some of my people with you. So here, here we see Yaakov being his classic wriggly self. And he says, oh, I can possibly go quickly because, oh, everyone would instantly die if I did so. And Esav says, really, if that's such a problem, I can leave people with you and help out. Apparently your children are super frail. Um, um, and ya Yaakov responds, why is this? Let me return favor, uh, let me find favor rather in the eyes of my Lord. So Esav turned that day on his way to Sa'ir, but Yaakov traveled on to Sukkot and he built for himself a household and he made shelters for his livestock. He named, called the name of the place Sukkot. So he built Sukkot for his livestock. Okay, so this is the only story pre-Exodus, pre the giving of this holiday. So what is it about this story that God wants his people to remember, to have called to mind every time they say the name of this festival, Sukkot, and celebrate it? What's in this story? Um, I'd love to hear how you guys think it links with the last one, by the way, and whether the possibility that Yom Teruah slash Rosh Hashanah is also in the story. I'm not sure where that would be, but uh, y'all are smart people. All right, so um, why does he want them to think of this story? Um, using our critical thinking and not just having lullaby effect like, oh yeah, I kind of remember this story. What's wrong with Sa'ir? Why won't um, Yaakov go with Esav? Isn't like the culmination of their story, one person wrongs another, um, he asks for forgiveness, the other one gives forgiveness, and they are hug and are happy again, and they go on totally reconciled, right? That would be the story we expect but they go to go on and Yaakov still says, no man, no, no, it's not for me. Um, I'll totally go though. And then uh, Esau says, okay. And Yaakov instantly pieces out, trickster, trickster patriarch, right? So why, why not? Here's why not um, uh, amongst some other reasons that we can imagine. 
but Sa'id, most simply, is not in the land that God promised to Yaakov's forefathers. Um, there are dimensions to the land. God spoke about it'll go from this river to this sea, and it'll go from here to here. And Sa'ir is off to the side in um, around Wadi Rum, if you've ever seen that on Google. Um, you can, it's a really beautiful area, very mountainous and crazy desert to live in uh, that Esau would choose, but maybe it wasn't that way at that time. Um, but anyway, it's not within Yaakov's calling. Yaakov had to say no to the comfort and convenience, the power, resources, and protection that came with being his brother, being with his family, in order to stay on his target, to stay within his calling. Um, almost reminds us of what Jesus says about setting aside our family, right? As <laughs> not being important at all compared to him, right? Um, so in our privileged landscape, we will often, if you're a person of privilege, um, be given opportunities. It will feel like magical doors open for us. Um, opportunities, products, offers, people saying, oh yeah, I can totally partner with you. Um, and we can feel like, oh yeah, I should totally take that, right? And saying no to stay in your calling, weighing that offer, not just like, oh, it was given to me and so that must be for me, but asking, is this part of what God has asked me to do and assessing that? And what does it take to stay in your lane and not say, oh yeah, I'll open that side hustle. Oh yeah, sure, I'll do that with you. Oh yeah, I'll say yes to all of these things that God hasn't asked me to do and get super overwhelmed and burnt out in a year or so. It takes trusting in God's provision for us that we will be okay if we say no. We will be okay if we don't start that side hustle or that extra job or that extra thing that you'll feel guilty if you don't do but isn't actually on your docket for a reason, right? That takes trust in God's provision. And so that brings us all back to the whole point of the holiday. That's what the people, God's people are supposed to remember every year. Not only are they coming together in this scrappy way, all these different trees coming together to make a tree for all these different birds to be in, right? And Chazakiel, they are also remembering if I stay in my lane and go where I'm supposed to, I'm leaving Egypt and I'm not going back. God will still provide for me and it is worth it to live in a booth even for 40 years in order to not get off track. Um, Sayyid was also a very wealthy place. There's lots of spice trading happening and Yaakov probably was really comfortable being the number two, right? He was with Lavan for a long time, if you know the story in Genesis and Bereshit, and he was constantly finding a way to get the upper hand. And for him, going and being with the new people would be doing the same. But he said no. He stayed in his lane. He trusted that God would provide. And it says he built a household in the land where he was supposed to be. So let us try to do the same. Try to trust. Um, and not just trust that God provides for us, but also be able to celebrate that God provides with us. And if that looks like looking weird and going out and camping together, I'm even more excited. Uh, yeah, so join us uh, 7.30 um, on Zoom Pacific time uh, to join discussion if you would like and uh, go on refugepullman.com to either give. We really need your help to get everything going um, to pay church staff a living wage, right? We're trying to get a building um, together. So we really need your help. We would love your gifts. Um, but then also there's a form on there to join in person as, for those services as well as online. So hit us up, refugepullman.com. I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to meet with your people over, uh, over technology. I thank you that you want to remind us throughout the year of good things. I thank you that there is not a holiday called, um, you know, 
dwell in how much I resent you for being my people day. There is only um, the day of covering and the day of trumpets and the day of deliverance and the day of provision um, or the week of provision. I pray that we would be able to celebrate that as your people, that we would have eyes of gratitude, eyes of thankfulness, eyes of trust going forward, that we would be alive to all the things that you're doing in our life. We need, um, we need your eyes, we need your spirit to be able to appreciate those things. Otherwise, we will just be trembling on in our old patterns, completely blind to how blessed we are by you. And so I ask that you'll be with us, um, and even in discussion today. I ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bye, guys. See you next week.